Well, once again, we come to a place where we can have another look at Jesus Christ in something of his splendor and power in, in being tempted and yet coming off um, completely sinless and in a glorious way. And as, as you can see by the intro words here, that this is coming on the heels of his baptism and his initiation into public ministry. And he goes from a total ministry high, namely the audible voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he, and he was just affirmed by uh, that voice out of heaven, which, which is God the Father, in front of huge crowds. And the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And John the Baptist confirmed that he was the promised Messiah. Now he's leaving the, journey, the, the Jordan from a mountaintop experience, and he's heading straight to the wilderness uh, for a duel with the devil. And also, uh, we get a powerful glimpse into the type of Messiah he was, and we'll learn how to stand firm in the face of temptation. That's what we have to look forward to. Well, this is just an intro um, ob observations about temptation. Temptation in, in and of itself is not sin. That's why we read that we can watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. You may be tempted, but you don't have to enter into it. You can watch and pray against it. And we know that our spirits are willing, but, but our flesh is weak. And we can be tempted, but we don't have to sin. And, and then again, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, he says, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. They're going to come, and they may even come by other people who will deliver the temptation to you. But we're warned. See, we're warned about temptations, and we don't have to obey the temptation. We don't have to fall into sin. And God promises this. He says, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. You're going to be tempted. You call upon the name of the Lord, and he will rescue you from it and keep the unrighteous under punishment uh, for the day of judgment. That, that, that kind of connects up with, with what it says in Luke. Somebody might tempt you, but he'll rescue you. He'll remind you of his will and, and of his power. So you don't have to sin. You, temptation in and in, in of itself is, is not sin. It's, it's a temptation to sin. And then you have the case where uh, a brother uh, has, <laughs> has fallen and, and he's, he's in trespasses. And if you're a spiritual person, you can go and restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But we've got to look to ourselves. We've got to see to it that, that we're not tempted in the same way. So that we won't be tempted, we have the duty of looking to ourselves and guarding ourselves. And then there's the case of sexual immorality. And the answer to that is, is to make arrangements and, and, and fashion our lives so we can avoid such things. Every man should have his own wife and every woman should have her own husband and be faithful to each other that's God's plan but 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 the reason it has to be like that is because there's temptation to all kinds of sexual immorality fornication adultery all kinds of things that the United States is characterized by and then we can keep in mind we've got a high priest who is who is not like this. We have a high priest. We do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness. Ah, we've got one that was tried by the devil and tried throughout his entire life. One who in every way and in every respect has, has been tempted as we are without sin. We can cry out to Jesus 
because he got the victory. He is able to help us. He resisted sin, and we'll learn something of how he did it in, in just a few minutes. And then there's also the temptation of, of those who desire to be rich. They fall into temptation. Don't desire to be rich. Just desire to have what God wants you to have, not to be a, a rich person. If riches come to you, fine, fine. But know that what can happen to a, a rich man because it's harder for him to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the, the eye of a needle. You may get plunged into senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So they can be dangerous. But the danger is, is, is only in desiring it. If God gives it to you, that's another matter. But searching after it and always wanting it is a dangerous thing to do. Resist that temptation because you don't want to fall in uh, to this I idolatry of, of possessions and prestige and, and all those things. Well, to whom does temptation be become a sin? Well, it's, it's, it's to the ones who do not watch and pray. They don't even think of that. They just go headlong in. It's... It's to those who don't look to themselves when they're correcting somebody else and, and don't realize that they too might also be tempted and they might even be guilty of the same thing. And it's to those whom God is not pleased to rescue. He is pleased to let them have their own preferences and to go their own way. So God doesn't rescue them. He passes them by and they get what they want. And those who do, who do not make the proper arrangements to avoid succumbing to temptation. There are places that you should not go. There are, there are relationships that you should not have. There are others that you should cultivate in order to not be tempted. That's what we need. And, 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 and then also those who are ruled by temptation, those servants of Satan... And they are, and they are tempting others. Uh, uh, that is sin for them, and and they lead others in in into sin. And those who idolize something else, that's what also can happen. A fascination with material things, with with uh, possessions, with this world, with other people. Um, um, then that becomes sin when, when you put something above and count something more precious, more a treasure to you than Jesus Christ himself. And those who refuse Jesus, the high priest, and his grace and power and enablement to resist, you can always call upon God. But if you don't do that, that the, the temptation may become a sin. Well, here, here is the nature of Christ's temptations found under three headings. Number one, the, the Son of God is tempted to use his power for his own needs. That, that's, that's, that's what the devil tempted him to do. Number two, the Son of God is tempted to pursue his reign and, and, and his prestige apart from the Father's plan. That's what the subtle temptation of the devil was to him. And the Son of God is tempted to test his Father's promise of protection. Uh, he, here's our first scripture then. The Son of God is tempted to use his power uh, for his own needs. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned uh, from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. He applied the scriptures immediately to this case. 
the first thing that you observe is that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, and he and he was coming from a mountaintop experience at the Jordan River, but he's being led by the Spirit, and he goes into the wilderness. He goes to a low place, an, an obscure place, an isolated place. He goes by himself, and he's there for 40 days, and he will be tempted by the devil. And, and what we learn from that, of course, is that even a godly person, even a pure and holy person like Jesus, can face fierce temptation. You know that godly people, that even pastors and, and, and really spiritual people have had terrible falls. Just being a godly person, just being mature and, and experienced doesn't guarantee that you might fall in to fierce temptation. And know that God is not absent in, in the midst of temptation. He is very present. He is with you. He, he promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. You're never alone. God is always near you. You can lean on him when temptation comes. And God has a purpose in temptation. His purpose is a positive one. He wants us to pass the test. He does not want us to fall. He does not want us to fail. He never wants us to sin. He, 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 he wants us to show the evidences of our graces, of, of things that once ruled us no longer rule us. We can prove it. And, and when we overcome a temptation, we're actually strengthened not to repeat it. If we succumb to it, then we're weakened to it. But we learn that our graces are proved and, and strengthened when we are tempted and when we resist it and, and when we overcome it. Well, you see that uh, in the rest of, of the passage, y you see even more. You see how Jesus fought against the devil and, and how he instantly and reflexively could resist what the devil was tempting him to do. You see the devil's strategy? He goes for the best moment. He goes not on the first day, not on the fifth day, not on the 15th day, but he, he goes to Jesus on the 40th day. That's, he, he's gonna tempt him when he's the most vulnerable, when he's the weakest, when his hunger is crying out. And, 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 and so you remember it said that he, he fasted for, for 40 days and then when the days were over, that's when he was hungry. He was fine during that time, but now he's in a weakened condition. So, so, so know this for yourself. He'll go for the best moment, and he'll, and, and he'll go when you're vulnerable, when you're tired, when you're weak, when you've been worldly-minded. And it was not an inappropriate desire. It, it, it was only bread. Just turn these stones in, into bread, and it's within reach. You can do it. You can get it, Jesus. Why don't you just do it? But see, what was behind it was serve yourself. Don't trust God. Don't wait for God. Don't be patient. Don't be content eat, even though you're hungry. That's what was behind the whole temptation. So when Adam was faced with uh, temptation, he, he was under a similar circumstance. Food was not sinful in and of itself. It was only fruit. What made it sinful is that that was the one tree. You didn't have to go to that tree, Adam. You had all the trees of the garden and all the vines and all, and all the produce of, of the land. And it appealed to his flesh. It looked good. It was a healthy thing to eat, whatever kind of fruit it was. It was probably juicy and and aromatic, but uh, he was not fasting. He was not necessarily hungry. He had plenty of food. 
And he forgot his spiritual priority was to listen to what God said. You may eat of all these, of all the produce of the garden, whatever you want, but only one tree, just one. You're not to eat of that. And of course, you know he failed. But when you see Christ, Christ, he is tempted in the context of really felt hunger and, 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 and only for a loaf of bread which would help his appetite. And we see in Christ it's a legitimate appeal, but not to serve himself. It's okay to eat bread, but to turn stones into bread for yourself, to use your miracle working power for Jesus and not for others and not for the glory of your Father, that's where the sin would have been. But in Christ, the spiritual priorities were prevailing. He wanted to always do what was pleasing his Father, and he was able to do that. Uh, he, he never sinned. And of course, he had complete and perfect and, and enough to share with all of us, a perfect righteousness for us. He had success. Well, the devil's strategy with Adam was, of course, God is holding something back from you. Uh, what I'm offering you will make you like God, and you will know good and evil. And he's really not worthy of your trust. Did he really say that? Well, you see, what Adam failed to see is that he was already like God. God had made him separate from all other creation. He had made him in his image. He, he was already as much like God as any human being could be. He was not fallen. But, but he was like God in so many ways. that He, he could not have been better. With Jesus, he takes over the situation. The, the devil says, prove to me that you are the son of God. Why should he prove uh, to the devil anything? The devils know that he's the son of God. Throughout the scriptures, they're, they are troubled by him. They're afraid of him. But, but, but the devil says, work a miracle for me. Just do it for me. Well, Jesus... in he would prove his sonship two times. The devil says, if you are the son of God. But he's going to prove his sonship in, in abundant ways, in, in, in wonderful ways, in magnificent ways, but not according to the devil's specifications. Well, that's some, some heavy stuff. We learn the power of, of of the word the power that it had in jesus christ's life that that quick answer he was able to give it is written man shall not live by bread alone it was an ancient word moses tells the people that god humbled them and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know something that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That's what Israel needed to learn. That's what the Jews needed to learn. They'd never seen manna, but God said he would bring them to the promised land. He would feed them. He would nourish them. He would, be, he would give them water. He would make rivers of water flow for them. All they had to do was, was trust him. They would have lived if they lived by the word that comes from the mouth of the, of the Lord. That's what Jesus was doing in a New Testament sense. Well, how shall we respond to temptation and, and trials based on, on, on what we, we, we've been talking about? Well, we can hold on to our faith knowing that God is in control. He's got all these circumstances and he wants us to succeed. And we can ask and we can search for what is written just like he did. We can memorize a scripture if we have a, a repeated temptation. We can be in the word 
and we will be able to resist it. We'll know what the Bible says about this and with a, 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 about whatever confronts us. And we can view these circumstances as opportunities to grow in our faith and to practice and prove what we believe. That's what so many suffering saints do. They, they are tempted to deny the Lord in order to escape suffering, but they don't do it. And they prove what they believe even if they seal it with their own blood. That's a wonderful, glorious thing. We can know for certain that God is with us even though we may not feel that way in the midst of our troubles. Look for him there. Call upon him there. And you will hear from him. And by grace, by his grace, we can face the difficulty with just one purpose in mind, with just one primary goal. Make me to obey you, O Heavenly Father. Make me to do what is right. Make me to glorify you. Well, then, in the second place, the Son of God is, is tempted to pursue his reign apart from the Father's plan. We read that the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. We don't know how he did this. It may have been through a vision. Whatever he did, we're like little children. We, we just take the word for what it says. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and all their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, You shall not worship the Lord your God. You, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. See, what, what, what the devil wants to argue is that I, I've, I've, I've got everything. It's, it's, it's been delivered to me, and, 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 and I'm sovereign. I, I, I can give it to anybody I want to. What, 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 is that right? Well, there is a certain sense in which this is the devil's world. Uh, God says to us, to the Apostle Paul, that, that we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. We were slaves following the course of this world, following the prince and power of, of the air, the spirit that is now at work in, in the sons of, of disobedience, he has authority. He can work in the sons of disobedience. He has some in, in influence. He goes about as a, 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 a roaring lion, but he's not sovereign. And he's not om, omnipresent. He may be ubiquitous, is what we say. That, that means his presence is felt. In, in every place, but, but he cannot literally be in every place. We're told that we wrestle, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's, that's what the devil's got, but it's not complete and it's not absolute. And, and it's not prevailing in every place. He is pushed back. He is on a leash. He, he is on a chain. But in a certain sense, he does have, we does have this power. This verse uh, where John tells us that we know that we are from God. And this is this ubiquitous idea. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's true. You see the devil's influence in, in every nation, in every country. There is no sacred place that is exclusively godly and righteous. But that day will come. But see, actually, this is Jesus' world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe, not only the world, but the entire universe. All the planets, all, all the stars, all the galaxies, all the oceans, everything. He's the one that owns it. 
he's he's the one that up, uh, upholds it by, uh, by its power without the word of his power everything would fall apart and because of this it's this world belongs to the son of god it belongs to the godhead all things were made through him that is jesus christ and without him was not anything made that has been made anything you see from the microscopic to the gargantuan to things that we cannot see without telescopes or microscopes god the son made all of these things not the devil not some evil force, not evolution. They were made by him. But here's, here's the challenge to our Savior Jesus. John says that he was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. That's the, the depravity of man. That's, the, the, that's how fallen we are. It's Jesus' world but Jesus has to be patient and humble, which he was, because it was not yet manifested. It's not yet observed that he is the creator, but it will be one day. We're certain of that, more certain of that than anything else that we can think of. Well, how does Jesus handle this then? Jesus cuts through the devil's argument not by discussing who owns what and who has the authority over what, whether it's him or whether it's, it's the devil. This is what it's really all about. Verse 7 says, If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Well, Jesus answered him and said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve that's what the issue is every time that jesus has an argument with anybody or has a discussion with anybody he gets to the heart of the issue it's you who are a little faith that's the problem you're not perishing but the problem is your faith maybe you remember the uh, rich young young ruler when, when, when he wanted to know, what do I do? What, what good deed do I have to do in order to get eternal life? And Jesus tells him, he, he, he gives him parts of the, of the Ten Commandments. And then the rich young ruler says, all these I have kept, what do I lack? Jesus does not go back and say, have you ever hated anyone? Uh, that's the same as murder. Have you ever lusted after a woman? That's adultery. Have you ever taken something or, or stolen away time? Have you ever told a white lie? You mean to tell me that you've always obeyed your parents, your father, and your mother since you were a little boy? And you are purporting to have loved your neighbor? as your... That, That's not what he goes for. He goes for the heart of it. He goes for his idolatrous, covetous life. He says to him, if you would be perfect, sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for his God was his great possessions and his God was himself. He wanted to keep what he had. He did not want to share it with anybody else. That's how Jesus, he, he, he goes for the heart of it. Well, in offering the world without righteousness and without purity is offering nothing. That's, and, and Jesus knew that. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with all its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Jesus had what abides forever. He didn't want what was passing, what was temporary, what was ultimately going 
to, to be destroyed. He was able to overcome that. He's going to continue to worship God. For what does it profit a man? Uh, Jesus asked, he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul. Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? See, your soul, our souls are worth more than the whole world. And yet, sinners that ultimately perish only get a small portion of, of this world. They settle for just parts of, of, of the world. And, and all the while, their soul is worth more than the whole world. It's, it's of measureless worth. But they go for the power and the prestige and the, and the position and the possessions, we could add, and the pleasures that come from all of these things. But they're all passing away. So the world, whatever Satan was offering Christ, was, was worth next to nothing because of its temporary nature and because of its sinful fallen nature and, and because Jesus already owned. He, he already owned the world. Well, we learn then that you're to worship the Lord and the Lord alone. You shall have no other gods before me. That's Exodus 20 and verse 3. That's the controlling principle. You're not going to worship the devil and you're not going to worship even good things. Not even, even your children. You're not going to treasure other things more than God. And that's why Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve not alongside anything else, exclusively. The object, the person of worship is, is, is the Trinity. It's God the Father, it's God the Son, it's the Holy Spirit. That's what we must do, and that's the controlling principle. We should not treasure anything more than we treasure Jesus Christ, not even close to Jesus Christ. Well, we learn then we learn that we can and must trust God's word to guide us. And we must be careful of a complaining, impatient, discontented, irritated, or even angry spirit. Even if others can't see that, those are sins as well. We're to do all things without grumbling or complaining. And we're not to have unrighteous anger. Those are things that, that, that we've got to work on and apply the Word of God to it. We must never forget the cross. I'm, I'm telling you, if you plant the cross in the midst of your temptations and trials, you will not sin. Draw those images, draw the dripping blood, draw the nail-pierced hands and, and feet, draw the crown of thorns, draw that horrific suffering that Christ died uh, for, for the very sin that you are tempted to do, and you'll not sin. And we can always call out. We can always pray. We can call out for grace in our times of need. Just like Jesus did, let the word of God alone. That's what he did. Let it speak for you as it spoke for him. Wonderful, wonderful thing. And trusting God's plan. God's purposes is the best place to be when you're looking up to God and you acquiesce, you, you agree with him, and you're going to do his will. Well, here's our last point. We see that uh, the devil's going to strike out one more time, but he took him to Jerusalem and he set him on the pinnacle of, of, of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, he wants to prove his, his sonship. He's going to prove it in, in other ways. I've already told you that in magnificent ways like nobody else ever could. He says, throw yourself down from here for it is written. He's going to quote scripture now. 
He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. We fasten on that. An opportune time was the rest of his life. He was under constant temptation, but he was able to resist it. Well, when you take, when the devil takes a scripture out of context, here's, here's, here's the scripture, it's from Psalm 91. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Just yank it out of context, and he thinks it's a ticket to do anything you want, to test God in this and see whatever I do, he's going to guard me. He's, he's going to command angels concerning me, and they're going to bear me up, and my foot's not even going to strike a stone. Is, is that what this is teaching? Well, it's found in this context. It's found in the person that has made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is your refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. God will cause everything to, to work together for good for you. And he will command his angels if that is his will. And they will guard us in all our ways. And the other half of the sandwich can be this. It's all from Psalm 91. Because he holds fast in love, in, to me in love, the person that loves God will find multiplied deliverances. He will be protected because he knows my name. And when you pray, when you call to God, you will, get, he, you will be answered and, and he will be with you. He will never leave you in your trouble. See, that's the context of it. It's not meant to, to, to be used to test God. As I've been saying two times, the devil has tempted Christ with, if you are the Son of God, prove it. Prove it by working a miracle. Work something for me. Show me according to my standard. This is what Jesus did. This is why he is the Son of God. Jesus was conceived by the omnipotent, incomprehensible working of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary. He's the Son of God. He was completely and uniquely, no other person except Adam uh, before he fell, but not like Christ, who suffered multiplied temptations. He was completely sinless, sinless, faultless, blameless, because he is the Son of God. He did not commit any sin, and he left, and he left nothing out. He loved God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself perfectly and completely. And there was never a man like Jesus to prove his sonship who spoke the way he spoke. No one ever spoke truth. No one was ever like Christ. Not Buddha, not Mohammed, not, not any of the, of the other in, invented gods who can't hear or speak or see or do anything good for a man. And you could make a list of his miracle working power that, that, that proved that he was a son of God. No one could raise the dead. No one could heal leprosy. No one could multiply loaves like that and do that two times. No one could be with um, uh, Moses in, in, in the transfiguration. No one could do the works 
of, 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 of Jesus. No one could do any of those things unparalleled. And Jesus was in total submission to his father, even to the abandoned death on a cross. He, he obeyed in that torturous uh, situation, being totally abandoned by God, which caused him to cry out like that. And he rose from the dead af after three days. He did not decay. He did not experience uh, corruption. Why? Because he's the son of God. And he visibly went up to heaven. He ascended to the clouds with the disciples looking on and angels coming down to speak to his disciples. And he will come again in great power and he will judge the world. And he is believed on by multitudes on, on this earth. Every nation is, is going to hear the gospel and unreached peoples and unengaged peoples will be reached. Martyrs have counted him so precious, they'd rather die than, den than to deny uh, the Son of God. His kingdom knows no retreat. It only knows advance. It's never diminished. It's never deterred. It's unstoppable. And it shall have no end. That's our Jesus. That's, that's, that's the Son of God. This is how he, he, he proves it. And as I say, you may have thought of, of other things. But, but we learn then, and I have uh, saved this scripture uh, because there's so much hope in it. It's a very familiar scripture, but, but there's also a promise in it too for us. It brings so much comfort. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. These are universal temptations. They occur in, in other people. But here's the promise. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted be, be, beyond your ability. It, it, it may feel like that, but the promise is, is, is that God is faithful. We can hope in God because with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. We've got to look for it. It's there. He promises that. And his goal is that you may be able to endure it. So much hope in a familiar passage of Scripture. God is faithful. He controls the strength of the temptation. It will not be beyond your ability. And he will also provide a way of escape. And his whole goal is that you may be able to endure it, that you'll glorify him, and that you'll escape it. Praise the Lord. And here's one last passage as we close uh, from Isaiah 41.10. God says to us, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Our great God in heaven, how we thank you uh, for your great power and your great commitment and your great love to us. We thank you that you will uh, support us in every temptation. We can roll all our anxiety on you and you will take care of us. You are our defender. You are our healer. You are our, our protection. You are our rock of refuge. You are our strong tower. You're all that we need. We praise you. We worship you. We embrace you. We, we sit at your feet, and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.